for joining us from. And thank you so much for being here. My name is Makiba Charles Allende, and I am the Director of Science Policy with the International Association for Dental Research. And I will help to moderate us through a discussion of the mechanisms of accelerating the phase down in the use of dental amalgam. Looking through the lens of public health, looking at the progress thus far, research advancements into mercury-free alternatives, and also a very critical component of the phase down approach, proper waste management. So as Mr. Tuda mentioned, please feel free to add your questions to the Q&A box, as we hope to be able to answer several of your questions, time permitting. If you click on the three dots to the far right on the bottom of your screen next to the chat box, you will find the Q&A box. So I'd like to introduce our speakers, Mr. Enzo Bondiani, Executive Director of the FDI World Dental Federation, Dr. Godfrey Smout, Professor of Operative Dentistry at the University Hospital Regenberg, Dr. Christopher Fox, Chief Executive Officer, International Association for Dental Research, Dr. Elizabeth Shapiro, Chief of Governance and Strategy Management of the American Dental Association. And with closing remarks, we'll have Dr. Ben Yaya, President of the FDI World Dental Federation. Okay, so let's not waste any time and jump right in. Over to you, Enzo. Thank you, Makiba. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Enzo Bondioni, and I'm the executive director of the FDI World Dental Federation. So the FDI is a federation of national dental association and other specialized organizations. Uh, we are about 200 members uh, as of today and having presence in over 130 countries. FDI is the global voice of dental profession and works with its member organization to improve oral health and people worldwide, of people worldwide, sorry. Ahead of Minamata Conventions COP4, I am very excited to be here uh, with you today and to speak about dental amalgam, but more specifically, I will be talking about the rationale of the current approach to phase down dental amalgam use and the need to adapt phase down strategies to natural contexts. So I thought it would be important to start uh, the, this event and my presentation explaining what dental amal amalgam, what is dental amalgam. So in addition to the ISO's definition, which defines amalgam as a filling material for teeth made of mercury and amalgam alloy, it is crucial to clarify that amalgam is a safe restorative material. The reason for the need to phase down dental amalgam is its environmental impact, and therefore we must find the right balance between protecting both the environment and public health. And why is that? So dental amalgam has qualities that are not fully met by the current uh, mercury-free alternative. Despite what has been said in uh, other events, it is easy to use, durable, cost-effective, especially for restorations of large cavities, as it will be explained later by Professor Schmaltz. That means that Current alternatives cannot be considered full replacement of dental amalgam for all clinical cases yet. It is important to flag here that we are talking about a method used for more than 150 years to treat dental caries that is still the most pre prevalent disease around the world. So a premature uh, global phase out of dental amalgam before the avail availability of safe, effective and affordable alternatives will impact the provision of quality treatment, particularly in resource limited uh, settings where we will see an increase of teeth extractions. As representative of the oral health community, we feel a responsibility to raise such concerns and therefore a comprehensive phase down approach is still needed. Next. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. As you know, the Minamata Convention on Mercury is an international legally binding instrument to protect human health and environment from the adverse effects of mercury. Article 4 regulates the phase out of mercury added products with one exception. Countries do not need to phase out, but need to phase down the use of dental amalgam, as described by Annex A, Part 2 of the Minamata Convention. 
This is due to the public health implications that a global and premature deadline for a complete phase out would entail, threatening to widen oral health inequalities. My colleague, Dr. Fox, from the International Station for, De for Dental Research will go in detail through the requirements and provi provisions of that Annex A, Part 2, that you see here on the screen. What is important to note is paragraph 9 of Article 4 says that when reviewing Annex A, the availability of mercury-free alternatives that are te technically and economically feasible must be assessed, consider considering also their environmental and human health risk and benefits. This evident evidence is yet missing. There is a lack of available information on mercury-free materials, especially around the safety profile of biocompatibility of certain materials. In countries where advanced alternatives um, uh, are fully safe, accessible and affordable, phase-out can be considered. However, this cannot be imposed as a one-size-fits-all solution on all convention parties as they need to adapt phase-down strat phase strategies to their national context. Next, please. As you may know, at the face-to-face -face segment of COP4, there are currently two amendments of Annex A to be considered. The first one is uh, the EU proposal that aims to further regulate the phase-down approach by adding to Annex A Part 2 a series of restrictions on the use of dental amalgam by 2024. And it is actually uh, mirroring the regulation regulation that is in place uh, right now uh, in the European Union. On the other hand, the second one, uh, the, uh, the African proposal asked to replace the current Annex A Part 2 with a phase-out strategy by 2029, leaving out the current emphasis on prevention, on research into alternatives and waste management, areas that, of course, still require a lot of attention. How is it possible that there is a proposal that leaves out such important public health consideration? If the African proposal is approved uh, with three fourth majority, that would mean that Annex A Part 2 is fully replaced. Prevention if efforts, research in alternatives and waste management will be, will be left out of the convention, and this is just not acceptable. Next, please. So the main issue we have here is the lack of engagement between the environmental and health sectors at national level. The convention actually, actually says that the conference of the parties in considering health related issues or activities should consult and collabor collaborate with WHO and promote collaboration and exchange of information with WHO. Although it says it should, we believe it should be a must. The success of the Mindamart Convention in achieving uh, its health-related objectives depends upon health ministries to also play a leading role in collaboration with ministries of environment. We know that uh, this is the area that poses most challenges. Uh, as an example, the, the report that you see uh, on the screen, uh, the latest Mindamart Convention initial assessment report from the WHO denounced the lack of engagement with ministries of health. And this is a shame as social solution should be found together. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yes, thank you. So all this to say that any review of the Annex A Part 2 beyond reinforcing the current phase down approach, for instance, for instance, by establishing a deadline for convention parties to adopt all the current provisions would be premature, having undesired undesired public health implications. So I will give you five reasons why. This will be based on experience uh, uh, from the oral health community, but also uh, on the FDI members around the globe. So first, the phase down approach is currently working. Progress has been mainly measured by counting the number of countries who no longer use amalgam at all, instead of looking at phase-down indicators. One example would be a reduction of, am of the amalgam sold. Major producers of dental amalgam have ceased manufacturing, uh, and the dental profession is shifting towards the use of alternatives, ma alternative materials in most cases, where available and suitable for the restoration. Second, the emphasis on prevention remains crucial. It was said in previous events, prevention is really crucial. The convention pre 
presents a unique opportunity for the prevention of caries, reducing the demand for restorative materials, in investing in public health measures to promote oral health must, be, must remain a priority everywhere. This is notably, ab notably absent from the African proposal. More prevention means less restoration, being with amalgam or with any other restorative material. Third, more research on alternative materials is needed. Evidence on the health and environmental impact of new restorative materials is needed for alternative materials to be considered as viable replace replacement to dental amalgam. Data on their similar clinical longevity and cost effectiveness is needed. Fourth, alternative materials must be accessible and affordable. You cannot, you cannot compare only the prices of the product, but all the setup needed to place alternatives. The supply chain for alternatives is also a problem. If dental care is not affordable, there is a risk that people will not seek treatment, leading to more teeth extractions and social consequences. An important concern sh shared by our members, for instance, Uganda. Fifth, the waste management remained the most important action point, uh, even in a phase out scenario. Countries need to put in place if efficient structures to manage mercury waste, including dental amalgam, but this is missing in many developing countries and especially in Africa. This is another key area excluded by the African proposal. My colleague Dr. Shapiro from the American Dental Association will discuss this in more detail in just a second. A wider focus on management, on waste management is really needed and similar concern need to be extended on the disposal of alternative materials. So all this is food for thoughts. I would like to end my presentation here and give the floor back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much, Enzo. Uh, your final slide on the key arguments just emphasizes the fact that this is not a one size fits all scenario and that phasing down is the equitable and feasible approach. So next, I'd like to hand over to Gottfried and Gottfried, I'd love for you to tell us about research advancements made thus far. Gottfried, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Matiba, for your kind words. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Professor Gottfried Schmalz. I'm Professor for Operative Dentistry. And for many years now, I've been involved in the research and development of alternative materials. And I'm also the chairman of the ISO Technic Committee for Dentistry. So please, the next slide. In recent years, a lot of uh, research has been done to develop uh, materials for dental, for dental restorations uh, in order to replace amalgam. Uh, and we have uh, developed no replacement, but we have developed a number of alternative materials. And the so first is, and you know this probably, is a resin composite materials, which is a direct restorative, which is placed directly into the cavity. You see it on the right top slide picture and then it hardens there, and then you have the filling uh, finished. Second, we have glass ionomer cements, and you see the, the row below, uh, which are mixed, put into the cavity, and then they harden, and we have combinations. We have also indirect restoratives like crowns, inlays, and partial crowns, but I will not cover those here because they are very expensive due to the involvement of technicians. Next slide, please. However, uh, although we are working quite a lot on this uh, topic, uh, we think there are still existing problems. And one of the most important is the longevity. This has always been discussed. And I will talk about this for resin composites and for glass ionomers. On the top, you see some clinical pictures. And you see on the left one what we call secondary tooth decay, which is tooth decay next to the restoration. And you see it here on composite resin restorations. And for the GIC, this is glass ionomer cement, you see fractures. I just want to share with you one study, and I think it's one of the biggest studies from dental practice from the, from the United Kingdom. And there are the, the, the success rates are compared survival rates of restorations. And for instance, go to 10 years, and you see for 10 years, Amalgam um, uh, survival rate of 51%, composite resin 43%, and glass ionomer 
So you see on this overall estimate that uh, the longevity of amalgam is still better. And if you look into more detail, you can find that amalgam, especially for the big cavities and especially for the difficult clinical situations, are still a problem. Next slide, please. Next problem is the technique, or what we call the complex technique. And this is on the first row, a series of pictures on how you place a resin composite. On the left one, you see the cavity. It's not a big one, it's a medium or small one. And then you see all the steps involved until it ends up at the right side for the right circle for the very nice uh, restoration at the end of this series. So this shows you the complex technique. Glass ionomer cements, row below, um, they are much more simple to apply. They are self-adhesive, so it's rather simple to work with them. And they have been uh, used in many cases in the atraumatic restorative treatment technique. This is a special technique which has been developed for developing countries, and especially what we call class one, which means small uh, cavities. And there it works. But for the general use, for bigger cavities, for instance, um, the, uh, these materials are inferior, and I refer to a Cochrane database systemic review. Next, please. Yeah, and the consequence of this is the costs. Yeah? Uh, we have heard and we hear that in some uh, Scandinavian countries, amalgam has been taken away and they have uh, written up their experiences and they say, okay, costs of treatment increase. And it's clear if you see how the technique uh, is um, working and the increases between 30 and 50% other um, research reports are even higher. And this is also for what we call bulk technique, which are new materials which are a little bit easier to use. And the reason, and this is very important, is not the material. Of course, materials are slightly more expensive, but this may change. But the most important thing is the complex technique. And the consequence of this is that if resources are missing in some parts of the world or wherever, more extractions and more oral health inequalities will worldwide occur. Next slide, please. Yeah, and of course, uh, safety is a is a, 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 a topic which is very important, of course. And for amalgam, which has been used, this has been um, explained by Enzo for 150 years and more. Um, there are a lot of um, uh, reports being published, and one, one of the more recent one from the International Association for Dental Research in 2020, and they evaluated the best available evidence. So, what is there? Which data do we have? And IEDR affirms the safety of dental amalgam for the general population. So those without allergies to amalgam components or severe renal diseases. And more or less the same has been issued by the World Dental so, so, this, yeah, by the World Dental Association in 2021. They said that the preponderance of available evidence does not link the presence of amalgam restorations with chronic and degenerative diseases and so on. I make it shorter here in the general population. So what about the alternatives? Uh, the EU Commission has a scientific committee and they looked into it and also the IADR, which has been mentioned above, looked into it. And the consequence of all their uh, analyses is that non-mercury containing alternatives are not free of any concerns uh, about adverse effects and just you see uh, allergies or and estrogen uh, mimic materials uh, which are released uh, from the substances which have to be uh, taken into account. Next slide, please. Yeah, and now what's going on? A lot of work is done. I cannot show you everything, just a few things. So the resin path is now being uh, improved. Um, we, this is, uh, we want to um, get away from the degradation. We want to make more resistant resins. Or we use a new chemistry, like what is called ring opening molecules. And you see here on the picture left, leakage. Leakage is where bacteria and saliva enters between the restoration and the tooth. And this leads to tooth decay, to secondary caries. On the right one, you see um, the leakage 
a mound and a very little bar on the right is a ring opening molecule. So this is one idea to improve the materials, mainly in vitro tests so far. Next slide. Or we can use uh, better adhesives to, to, to adhere better to the tooth with universal adhesives. You see the data for the uh, uh, publications are 2022 this year or self-adhesive materials is also underway, mainly in vitro investigations, very little if no uh, clinical studies. Or we can use nanosilver bioactive materials to um, get away with the bacteria which may cause carriers. And you see on the right side, studies, in vitro studies, where you use these silver containing adhesives to prevent secondary kidneys. No, next slide. So, a lot is being done, and I only could give you a slight, a little tiny uh, picture of it. So, what are the challenges? The productivity of our in vitro and our laboratory study is limited. This is what we simply must uh, realize. And we can use them for selecting best candidates, but we urgently need randomized clinical studies, what we call bedside studies. This is necessary. And the success of a restoration can only be evaluated after a long time. So it's not like a medicament, which you can evaluate after a couple of months. We need five to 10 years. We still have to cover the cost aspect. And we have to have the implementation aspect. We are implementing the composite resins into daily practice for the universities. But if we have new materials, this must be uh, tried again, and we must need the equipment. Next slide. So now I come to the conclusion of my presentation, and uh, I want to stress that new alternative material indeed have been developed. Still, uh, we have problems, so we are not at the end. Um, the affordability, durability, and safety are topics of major concern. And uh, we are working on uh, in our research environment uh, very actively uh, to solve these problems. But due to these technical problems, which I refer to, frankly, no reliable indicator of a timeline can be given. Everybody asks me, so when are you ready? So I say, we do our best. The only thing what I can really say, honestly say, support in research certainly accelerates the phase down of dental amalgam. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Gottfried. Um, an exciting look into what may be on the horizon, but there's still more work. There's still more research to be done. So now I would like to hand over to Dr. Fox to take us through some of the action needed as we continue to phase down. Uh, Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Charles Ainde, and if I could have the next slide. I'm Christopher Fox, the CEO of the International Association for Dental Research, and I thought I would um, start as uh, Mr. Bondioni did with the with the Annex A Part 2 as it exists right now. And uh, this legally binding treaty um, uh, includes measures to be taken by a party to phase down the use of dental amalgam. And there are nine provisions in which the parties are included, uh, encouraged, um, or, or stated to include two or more of the measures from the following list. And I'm going to concentrate just on the first uh, provision, which is the um, prevention and health promotion aspects, thereby reducing the need for any uh, dental restoration. But each of these nine provisions is so important for the uh, phasing down of dental amalgam including education, um, uh, research into alternatives, as uh, Professor Schmaltz just reviewed, um, uh, education of current uh, dental professionals and the uh, uh, next generation. If I can have the next slide, please. And uh, importantly, uh, uh, use of amalgam in the encapsulated form, and then finally, best environmental practices for handling the waste, which Dr. Shapiro will get to at the conclusion of my presentation. So if I could have the next slide, please. And um, of the treaty itself says uh, uh, two or more of the provisions, and then at COP3, uh, there was a decision made that uh, encourages parties to take more than of two required measures. And we fully support that also. We actually think all nine are important, particularly if you want to talk about accelerating the phase down of dental amalgam. The next slide, please. 
And I thought I would um, uh, just put in perspective, particularly for the uh, non-dentists who may be on the on the webinar, the scale of the problem we're trying to address here. And the global burden of disease studies um, out of um, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation in Seattle has estimated that there are 3.5 billion people with oral disorders uh, in the world. That's roughly half of the population. And most of that disease is untreated dental caries, either in the permanent dentition, which is about 3 billion, or in the uh, deciduous or baby teeth uh, dentition, uh, that's another half a billion. So 3 billion people with untreated dental uh, caries, and that's the problem we are trying to address. So to take away a um, uh, safe dental restorative material uh, when we're not fully ready is going to lead to further um, health inequities. And um, uh, if I could have the next slide, please. And unfortunately, we have not made as much progress as we would have liked to in terms of the prevalence of oral disorders. And this is over a time period from 1990 to 2019. The number one uh, disorder or condition uh, from this global burden of disease studies is oral disorders in, in 1990 as well as uh, 2019. So we need to be doing better here. Uh, and if I can have the next slide. So this data that came from the Global Burden of Disease Study and other data sources led the World Health Organization to introduce the Oral Health Resolution last year in 2021. Uh, this was first adopted by the Executive Board in January of 2021 and then adopted by the World Health Assembly in May. And some of the key concepts in this Oral Health Resolution um, talk about the quality of life, healthy aging, the associations we know that exist between oral health and cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, pneumonia, and premature birth, uh, the shared risk factors of tobacco, the harmful use of alcohol, free sugars, poor hygiene, and the necessity to really integrate strategies of oral health into the overall non-communicable disease policies. We need to be looking at our workforce models, and then we need oral health services to really be part of essential health services to deliver universal health coverage. I could have the next slide, please. Uh, and this oral health resolution was introduced by the member state of Sri Lanka and supported by over 40 other uh, member states and also a broad coalition of non-state actors. So in addition to uh, IADR and FDI World Dental Federation, uh, we were joined by the NCD Alliance, Smile Train, uh, International Society of Nephrology, World Heart uh, uh, Federation, World Stroke Organization, all of these medical NSAs really recognize the importance of oral health and how it's uh, high time that we really uh, put the proper resources behind uh, addressing the oral health uh, conditions of the world. And I can have the next slide. And this was very uh, aptly uh, summarized by the Director General of the WHO, Dr. Tedros, who at the conclusion of last year's World Health Assembly said oral health has been overlooked for too long and we could not agree more. If I could have the next slide. This uh, oral health resolution um, had a, a, a lot of research that went into that, including that global burden of disease study. And I had the pleasure of writing an editorial with uh, uh, Dr. Benoit Varenne, who was on the previous uh, side event on the role of research in the WHO oral health resolution, both the data that underpins the resolution, but then also the research that will be needed going forward. But for the purposes of this webinar, I really want to emphasize that the WHO member states are committed through this resolution to integrate oral health within their national policies and as part of general health and to reorient the traditional curative approach towards a more preventive and health promotion approach to oral health. And the previous side event really uh, emphasized that quite well with Dr. Lowe from, from Hong Kong. Uh, and also we need to strengthen oral health care as part of universal health coverage. And the next slide. Uh, this oral health resolution calls for a draft global strategy, and this will be introduced in, in this coming May's World Health Assembly. And I just teased out from this draft strategy, uh, assuming it will hopefully be adopted, the preventive approaches that are within that that are really going to address dental caries and thereby reduce the need for any dental re restorative material. One is we need national oral care systems that are properly funded and that are integrated into overall health care. We need health workforce planning, and we need to target upstream causes of dental caries, including social and commercial determinants of health. We need to drastically reduce the intake of free sugars. Uh, we need to focus on the oral, oral health inequities that exist now, 
And again, as Dr. Lowe aptly uh, emphasized in the previous uh, side event, uh, the use of fluorides and community-based methods such as water fluoridation, salt fluoridation, milk fluoridation, but then also the use of fluoridated uh, toothpaste uh, in the home and uh, professional applications um, in, the, in the office and other settings, including uh, silver diamine fluoride. Now, if I can have the next slide. So if we really want to accelerate the phase down of dental amalgam, what we really need to do is integrate and synergize these two uh, initiatives. So on one hand, you've got the UNEP with the Minamata Convention on Mercury, and you're a party of the convention, but on the other side, you've got the WHO oral health resolution and the WHO member states. Well, every party of the convention is also a WHO member state. And the, the parties, or I shouldn't say the parties, but the, the uh, responsible folks within each of the governments tends to be the Ministry of the Environment for the UNEP uh, Convention, and then the Ministry of Health for the Oral Health Resolution. The UNEP uh, Minamata Convention obligates parties to phase down the use of dental mouth, and the way to really do that is to implement the Oral Health Resolution, which calls on member states to integrate oral health into overall health, re reorient towards a preventive approach, map and track fluoride, reduce risk factors, and strengthen oral health care as part of universal health coverage. So if we can get these two sides talking to each other, it's already been highlighted from the um, uh, uh, global consultation that that's not happening as much as it should, we're really going to accelerate the phase down of dental amalgam. And with that, I will turn the floor back over to our moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fox. A notable call to action at the end there with the need to integrate and synergize between the ministries of health and the environment. And we also heard this this morning during the, WH, the WHO's presentation as well. So our final presentation before we take some questions uh, is from Dr. Shapiro. So let's talk about separators and waste management. Uh, Dr. Shapiro, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Charles Sayende. I'm Elizabeth Shapiro. I am the Chief of Governance and Strategy Management with the American Dental Association, and it is my pleasure to get a chance to talk with you today. As you've heard from my colleagues, we support the phase down as outlined under the min original Minimata Convention. Um, this was carefully crafted to place focus on caries prevention, research, and reduction of emission into the waste stream. And that's what I'd like to address a for with you for a short while here. As we know, amalgam is safe, easy to use, durable, and cost effective. But as my colleague, Dr. Schmaltz, referenced, while we seek alternatives continually, we don't know when they will be available. The work is ongoing, and it would be delightful if by tomorrow we had something. However, even if we did have an acceptable, completely, uh, complete replacement for amalgam in our hands tomorrow, we must remember that amalgams still exist in a large, large number of the people in the world. Uh, in this recent study in the United States, we see that of the population who have restoratives in their mouth, over 50% of them are amalgam restorations. So we must consider how to be responsible and what the best management practices are to harvest that, uh, capture that, and recycle it appropriately. And this is where we come to the discussion of amalgam separators. Amalgam separators, um, there is a picture here for you of of one type of separator. For those of you who may not be familiar with what they are, uh, there are several different types. There are sedimentation systems. Um, there are centrifuge-based systems. Um, each have their different pros and cons. Some take up more floor space. Some take up less, less floor space. They are sized appropriate to the number of operatories um, that are within a clinic or within the dental setting. All of them should be ISO compliant with um, 11143, which came into effect in 2008. They effectively filter 95% of the amalgam waste. Um, the standard has been reviewed. Uh, the last time was in 2016. It does remain the most current version. To complete the picture of how it works in a dental office, uh, for those of you who are picturing in your mind your visit with your dentist, as work is being done in your mouth, there is a suction system that is removing waste. Um, there is a chair side trap that captures 
much of the material that is being removed in the excess water. And then the amalgam separator is further down the line uh, extracting more from that. And as we say, the goal is to reach 95% or greater, and many of them do re uh, reach that greater amount. If we can go to the next slide, please. Some countries have mandates in place. Many do, in fact. In the United States, our Environmental Protection Agency, in conjunction with the dental community, worked to have a regulation that the EPA put forth in July of 2017, and it came into full compliance in July of 2020. Australia also, their Australian Dental Association, began to address dental waste management in 2007, with its most recent revision coming in August, saying that separators should be installed. The European Union has had mandatory use of amalgam separators um, under their responsible practices. They all specify the same type of ISO 11143 separator. Um, and this is what we continue to advocate for under best management practices for the removal of and capture of amalgam in, before it enters the wastewater stream. Next slide, please. This is just a snapshot, very small snapshot, three months of some measures of the amalgam collected both in Australia and in the US with a, a fairly small data set. Um, looking at the first chart, it will tell us the number of separator service, uh, the, look at the amalgam collected on the first chart, excuse me, and the number of separators serviced on the second chart. The Australian is in blue, the United States is in green, and it's looking at a period from 2017 to 2018 and in quarters, three month quarters in through there. It's quite comparable and quite in line with what might be expected with separators that meet the ISO standards when we're looking at the amounts. We're seeing about 134 kilograms of mercury per month coming out in the US and 148 kilograms um, of mercury per month from Australia that were diverted from the waste stream. Um, and again, the amount of, of mercury retrieved from these separators is very consistent with the ISO standard. You'll see a bump up in the number of separators when we're looking at the chart um, to on your right. Uh, as we approach the middle of 2018, the July through September period, um, if you will remember when I was referencing amalgam separator regulations coming into effect in the US, that helped there. And in Australia, they were also ramping up their amount of separators. If you could go to the next slide, please, for me. So in a three-month snapshot um, in Australia, there is one company that provides the separators there and collects waste, so it's easy to track from them and, and gather some data. But you can see the numbers here. Over 1,000 kilograms of amalgam collected, and then the mercury separated out of that, 368 kilograms. Um, the amalgam separators that were serviced through there were 658. As I mentioned, waste is going to continue to happen um, even as we progress forward and we are progressing forward into the phase down. So we continue to need to address this issue. If you estimate that 6,580 separators could be installed, you could recycle 3.68 metric tons of mercury in three month period. And that's huge. That's very huge. They're critical for the environment whether or not the dentist is placing new amalgams, there are still existing restorations that will need to be replaced. If you can go to the next slide for me, please. If dentists are collecting all of this mercury, this amalgam base, <clears throat> what happens next? It is not just about the separators, and we need to think about this critically. The capacity to recycle is needed. The infrastructure development for countries that don't have it needs to be planned for and then executed. As I said, existing amalgam restorations and other mercury resources exist, so this need will continue to exist. Uh, recycling capacity isn't just about dental amalgam, it's about all of the mercury containing products. So it is wise for us to consider this thoughtfully and expand our thinking into how to provide this for other countries. Um, funding sources such as the Global Environment Facility, JEF-7, can be looked at. Uh, you'll find that there is a pilot program that is going to be launched for Senegal, Thailand, and Uruguay. 
that will be watched with much interest to see how that works to help them. Um, and we should, as we move forward through the Minimata structure, we should continue to consider thoughtfully how to best implement these waste management practices, because this is really critical when we're talking about protecting the environment. Thank you, and I will turn it back over to you, Dr. Charles Ayende. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. Okay, so let's get to the fun part um, where we can discuss or so have a little bit of a discussion based on the questions that you have provided. Um, I will ask all presenters to please turn on their cameras so that we may see your lovely faces. All right, so I guess this first question I will ask to Mr. Bondiani, and uh, he may start. Others, please feel free to chime in with your own perspectives. Uh, what would you say is the most significant infrastructure investment needed as we continue to phase down, specifically in the African region? Well, it's Am I muted? Yes, it's, it is not only the African region and it's like all regions need really to invest in waste management uh, and this is an environmental uh, convention and we are making a, a whole fuss about health and we should really concentrate on what really the topic is, which is how to manage uh, the waste uh, and it's mainly for the whole mercury including dental amalgam. So countries need to really invest in infrastructure to manage the waste because in, in, in this case, dental amalgam, you can have dental separators, you can have all, 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 all the setup within a, a, a dental practice. If at the end, there is not the structure uh, at a national level to eliminate this waste and to treat this waste correctly, uh, all this work is, is a little bit useless. Any others want to weigh in? I think that really sums it up and it feeds into Dr. Shapiro's uh, presentation where she talked about the need for that waste management infrastructure, even as we get to a point where there's a lower use of dental amalgam, the need for the proper maintenance of separators will continue to, to be there. Uh, Dr. Fox, you would yeah, like I, to weigh in. I, I would just add that there is a, a fabulous oral health strategy coming out of the WHO Afro region as well, out of uh, uh, Brazzaville. And again, one side is not talking to the other. So if you look at that oral health strategy for Africa, it's, it's um, if that's implemented, that's going to reduce the need for any restorative material as well as, as we were talking about uh, earlier. So there needs to be more communication uh, with the WHO Afro region too um, when we're talking about the dental amalgam. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm going to send a question to you, which is, should the phase down measures have a timeline? Dr. Fox. Well, I, I would love to have a timeline on all research. Uh, I would like a, a cure for uh, COVID-19 tomorrow. I would like a, a cure for AIDS uh, by next week. Uh, we can't put a timeline on research, as I think uh, Professor Schmaltz outlined very, very, uh, very nicely. We would love a, a alternative mercury free material that takes the place of dental amalgam in all clinical instances and in all in all settings uh, we don't have that we're working very hard in that and um uh, uh so we we can't put a timeline on it but we're working very hard to accelerate it what we can do is look at the progress we've made and how much the use of dental amalgam is declining uh, with as we improve our other uh, materials and as prevention starts to work thank you Anyone else wants to chime in? Yeah, if well, I, 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 can you? Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm, I must um, basically say the same. Uh, I've, I've personally uh, worked uh, 20, 25, 30 years now on replacement materials or alternative materials. And um, uh, the in vitro data were sometimes very promising. And then reality came back um, in the clinical studies. And so um, and that we had, then we had to go back to the bench um, to, to further work. So. It is tricky. I think we made quite some progress, uh, but uh, still, uh, honestly, uh, I cannot tell you um, a timeline. 
Uh, so, Dr. Smart, can you speak to specific clinical situations where dental amalgam fillings has advantages over the alternatives that can point us in a direction of where we need some more research to be done? Yes, now we must dig a little bit deeper into the problem. A cavity is not a cavity. You have large cavities, you have small cavities, you have problems with patients. Some um, I have a lot of saliva where you can not keep it dry. Uh, other patients, they cannot keep their mouth open for so many uh, yeah, minutes um, to make a filling or hours to make these fillings. So there are a lot of the different clinical situations. And what we know now in general in the big cavities, uh, where we um, have um, a, a large amount of material to put in, in these big cavities, under different difficult clinical situations, uh, there we still have a problem with alternatives. In the very tiny, small cavities, um, and if we have all the money in the world, we can use alternatives. Um, this is, uh, we know this, and, uh, but in the big, uh, large cavities, under the very difficult clinical situations, um, the classical alternatives like composite resins or glass ornament cements, they simply do not work. And this is what we should know. Uh, so, you know, people will say, yeah, use composites. I haven't successfully used composites. Yes, you can use these composites successfully in very special clinical cases. Yes, but in the very difficult one, it is still a very great challenge. Yeah, I, I would also add to that, um, you know, when you looked at Dr. Schmal's slide description of the technique sensitivity of placing composite resins versus the technique sensitivity of placing amalgams, which is much simpler. There are certain situations where perhaps um, you're a little more remote, their, their power systems aren't capable, or the equipment is not there to do all of that. Amalgams are highly functional, highly durable, and an excellent choice when called for in those, in those situations. Thank you so much. So, Dr. Shapira, I'm going to stick with you. I have a question about the cost of separators and the maintenance for proper waste management. So, can you speak to how this consideration of the cost and maintenance plays into the phase down approach? Right. It's a challenge um, and and the costs are, are so widely ranging depending on the needs of the particular practitioner or the clinic. You know, how many chairs are there? What size uh, amalgam separator do they need? And what type will they be selecting? Um, all of those range into what what it might cost. In addition to the cost of the actual separator and installing the cost of the separator, there is the cost of the maintenance. Um, if you have a properly sized uh, amalgam separator, um, typically, you know, it might be once a year that you will need to ship off a canister for recycling. So you need to have that in mind as well. And again, that varies from country to country about where you can ship it and how much it might cost. So for those places that have um, cost concerns where, where money is an issue, and certainly that encompasses a lot of, of, of the world, we need to look at some way to make this affordable. As I mentioned earlier, there's Jeff Seven that is doing its pilot project right now and has funding, perhaps that's an avenue when we look at that to see if that is a way to make it work. And while I am not certainly a, um, a, a grant, uh, totally grant savvy person in the terms of funding of things. There are other institutions as well that have a strong interest in protecting the environment and having clean water sources and things like that. Rotary International sponsors programs such as this in certain places. That might be an option. The Gates Foundation is very interested in clean water supplies also. So we do have to think broadly when we're thinking about how to fund all this and how to get the capacity built in every location, every country to be able to handle this. Because as I mentioned earlier, it is not just about amalgam waste. It's about the other forms of mercury that we need to be considering when we're figuring out how to take care of this. Thank you so much. Would anyone like to touch on that? If not, I would like to turn to Dr. Fox. Uh, we're getting a question here about the global strategy on oral health uh, and inequities. So can you speak to the potential impact of a phase out approach on oral health inequities? 
Uh, well, thank you. I, I feel maybe that question would be better answered by the uh, previous uh, side event with uh, Dr. Benoit Varen, but of course that's the concern is that we're going to increase health inequities if we have an immediate uh, amalgam ban before we're ready with the alternative materials before the research has shown us materials that will um, replace dental amalgam in all clinical um, settings. So that would be a grave concern uh, for us. And again, the scale of the problem 3 billion uh, untreated uh, uh, caries between uh, the permanent dentition and, and the uh, deciduous teeth or the milk teeth, uh, baby teeth. Um, it's just huge to, to eliminate uh, that as a restorative option and would very likely lead to an increase in inequities. And that's certainly something we don't want. And another reason why we want to be increasing a preventive approach as is outlined in the oral health resolution also, the WHO oral health resolution. Thank you. Great, thank you all. And looking at the time, uh, I want to take a quick second just to thank everyone for being here and for tuning in, in and providing questions to our session. I would like to hand over to Dr. Benyaya uh, for closing remarks. And please, I'd like everyone to welcome the president of the FDI World Dental Federation. Dr. Benyaya, over to you. I don't We're not hearing hear you just yet. I'm sorry. Thank you. Perfect. Sorry. Thank you, uh, dear all. I was invited to provide closing remarks to this important event as the president of FDI World Dental Federation, but most importantly as a representative of the oral health community in the African region. While the fast down of dental amalgam needs to be continued and reinforced in areas such as prevention, coverage and research into mercury-free alternatives and waste management, it's too premature to establish a deadline for a complete phase out globally as reiterated by Dr. Fox. This would have detrimental public health consequences that would only widen the all health inequalities that already exist, especially in low and middle income countries where the all health status of our populations is already poor and access to all health promotion and care services is scarce or even non-existent in rural and remote areas. In some regions, if there is no access to restorations with dental amalgam, tooth extraction is the only solution even in young adults. As reported by our network of national dental associations in Africa and other regions. However, it is important to highlight that this is not just about the availability and price of alternatives, but also about the complexity of the alternative restorative procedures, especially for large cavities, which cannot be performed everywhere. Moreover, many people have little or no access to products and services that will help them keep a good oral hygiene after a restoration, particularly in resort limited Sitting. Dental amalgam remains the most durable material for restorations. Other restorative materials often lead to retraction, and as explained by Professor Schmaltz, allowing the infiltration of bacteria over time when all hygiene is poor and leading to secondary to decay. This further increases the destruction of the dental tissues requiring practitioners in the majority of cases to extract teeth. Dental care should not be taken lightly. They are the most prevalent health condition globally, affecting more than 2.3 billion people. If caries are not adequately managed and treated, they can lead to infections and tooth extraction. Early tooth loss has negative consequences 
on the productivity and quality of life of those affected throughout their whole life course. As also highlighted by Professor Schmalz, more evident on the health and environmental impact of new restorative materials is needed. There is a lack of available information on mercury-free materials, especially around their safety profile and biocompatibility. For alternative materials to be considered as viable replacements for dental amalgam, for any clinical case, data on their similar clinical longevity and cost effectiveness is needed. Again, establishing a global phase out deadline before such evidence is available would be premature and detrimental to public health and even to the environment. We need to remember that Article 4, Paragraph 8, of the Minamata Convention mentions that when reviewing the phase, the phase down of dental amalgam, mercury-free alternatives need to be technically and economically feasible and consider the environmental and human health risks and benefits. As most mentioned by Mr. Bandioni, we must minimize the environmental impact of dental amalgam, but also protect our public health systems. Collaboration is key in Africa and all regions. In countries where advanced mercury-free alternatives are fully safe, accessible, and affordable, phase out can be considered. However, this should not be imposed as a one-size-fits-all solution on all convention parties as they need to implement fast down strategies adapted to their national context. These must include prioritization of the one, the prevention of dental caries, two, investment for the coverage and research into mercury free alternatives, and three, waste management of amalgam. As described in detail by Dr. Shapiro, Waste management is even relevant in a phase-out scenario. It concerns not only how we dispose of waste associated with new amalgam restorations, but also for that of all restorations that may be remo removed in dental facilities, and even more broadly, how such waste is managed as crematory. For instance, I am from Casablanca, Morocco, a country that currently only a signatory of, of the Minamata Convention in the process of ratifying this important treaty. In Morocco's second environmental performance review of 2021, my government announced its intention to draft an oral dental strategy, including for the elimination of mercury-based dental amalgam in a progressive and comprehensive way. They referred to a study identifying a lack of specialist companies for managing medical and pharmaceutical waste in Morocco, as well as on the shortcomings in awareness raising and training of all health practitioners. These challenges need to be addressed in a progressive and comprehensive way before a global phase out deadline is set. All parties of the Minamata Convention, and even those that have managed to, to phase out the use of dental amalgam, have a responsibility to protect both the environment and public health of populations worldwide. For all these reasons, I firmly, I firmly believe that any review of the current phase down approach for the use of dental amalgam beyond reinforcing the Minamata Convention's current provisions would be premature and detrimental to people's health. The African proposal would endanger, endanger public health by leaving out complementary measures on prevention, coverage, and research, 
into alternatives and waste management areas that still require much attention as it's the case for my country and region. As representatives of the all health community and in the interest of public health, we feel a responsibility to raise our concerns about this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Benyaya. We are unfortunately out of time. So we would love to thank you all again on behalf of the American Dental Association, the FDI World Dental Federation, and the International Association for Dental Research for joining us here this morning, this afternoon, or this evening. To everyone, thanks and have a great day.